welcome back to Psychedelics Today. This is Joe Moore, and we have on the show with us today... Kyle Bullard. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right, so Kyle and I haven't done an episode together in a while, um, so this is going to be pretty fun. Uh, before we get into it, we'll do a little intro stuff. Um, if you haven't subscribed to the show, please do so over at Spotify or iTunes or wherever you like your uh, podcasts dealt to you. We would love, love, love for you to subscribe. It would help us out. Um, the more people that listen, the cooler, more interesting guests we can get. So, uh, or at least it's easier for us to get those. So <laughs> anything helps. And if you want to help us uh, with um, reviews, feel free to leave one at any of those sites. We'd love it. Um, if you want to really, really support the show, we've got eBooks for sale, t-shirts, sweatshirts, all sorts of stuff over at psychedelicstayshop.com and a course called Navigating Psychedelics that we think is one of the top courses available right now on psychedelics. And it is very extensive. We'll get you um, from zero to 60, uh, not in a few seconds. It might take a few months, but you will have a great knowledge set and be able to deal with um, you know, real world issues around drugs and psychedelics and, and much more. Um, anything I missed there on Navigating Psychedelics, Kyle? No, um, we have a bunch of master classes, so that's the exciting part about it. I think we have like yes. uh, 12 to 14 different master classes, all on integration, self care by some experts in the field. So, um, yeah, definitely check it out. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Again, psychedelicstoday.teachable.com, or you can get there from our main, main website. And uh, to stay informed on developments, we've got an email list you might want to get on. We've got all sorts of cool stuff coming in the pipeline really soon, sooner than we're comfortable with, but <laughs> we're, we're making it work. So if you want to get surprised first, get on our email list and we'll talk to you there. All right. So let's get into it, Kyle. Um, <laughs> what have you been up to? We've uh, not really had you on the show for a lot of the episodes recently, but you know, what's going on? Yeah. Uh, thanks for taking over on the recording end of things. Um, yeah, my schedule kind of got pretty crazy. Um, once my internship started, I have have been just doing my internship a few days a week. Um, I'm working at a college in my town counseling uh, undergrad students on their life issues, trying to navigate what it means to become an adult and navigate the undergraduate years of their life. Um, it's been pretty awesome. I, I've been enjoying it. It's a really cool uh, site to be working at, pretty laid back um, for the most part. I mean, more laid back than some of my other clinical work of working with like early episode psychosis or <clears throat> um, at-risk teenagers trying to uh, kill themselves or something like that. <laughs> so yeah, uh, not dealing with as much crisis, which is which is kind of a nice change. Um, and it's kind of getting me, I guess, a little bit more um, associated with like what it's like to possibly be in a private practice. So it's nice. It's definitely, I think, getting me excited about the possibilities after I'm done graduating. So yeah, grad school is just kind of taking over my life at the moment, um, especially since internship has started. So it's been a difficult time trying to navigate scheduling podcasts. And so that's why Joe has kind of t streamlined that process and taken it over for the past few months, which has been awesome. Thank you, Joe, for that. Um, and yeah, and then I've been working on uh, a capstone project, um, and that's been taking up a huge chunk of my brain power, just constantly thinking about it, thinking <laughs> how I want to organize it, and then actually getting down and writing it. So um, that capstone project, I'm almost done with it. I'm, I'm sure by the time this episode's released, I'll have submitted it. Um, <clears throat> and a big shout out to Elizabeth Gibson and uh, Alan Davis looking it over for me R really appreciate that um and the capstone project is uh trauma resolution through breath work um and maybe we can dig a little bit more into that a little later but yeah it's been interesting process and uh i think it's i think it's pretty solid <laughs> <laughs> well let's give it a little bit of time so i think it's very interesting uh you know at first when we first started talking about it it didn't click to me why it was important um, but like we, you know, we had talked about it a lot of times um, for, for a while. Like, I think we started talking about it in the spring or something, yeah. maybe even earlier. So it's this new framework. Well, 
trauma theory meets a new framework and a way to involve breathwork in a clinical setting, maybe? Yeah, so um, um, I obviously <laughs> wanted to focus on um, breathwork for my capstone project and doing it within the clinical mental health counseling program, it needed to have some sort of um, clinical application or focus. So all of our work with Dream Shadow and doing, um, I guess, breathwork in that self-discovery, um, personal development realm, doesn't necessarily fit into the clinical model very much. Um, and then as I started to look to see if there was any research for breath work and like clinical um, applications in, in trauma, uh, there wasn't much there. And so part of this idea came from, I was at the MDMA training, I guess that was back in 2016. And I was talking to Michael Mithoffer about possible research in psychedelics. And he gave me a, kind of an idea of like, you know, if you want to like really do some research or get involved, like figure out something that could be an adjunct to psychedelic therapy um, and kind of go that route. And so I was thinking about that. I'm like, well, yeah, breath work. Like if I could figure out like a new way to work with breath work within that clinical capacity, like maybe it could be a pretty cool adjunct to psychedelic therapy. So, you know, the way that I was thinking about it was, um, I don't have any language, so I'm just making this up off the top of my head. <laughs> um, I haven't formalized <laughs> this part, but like an integrative breathwork approach. So integrative breathwork therapy model adjunct to psychedelic uh, therapy. And so my idea was to create this framework of working with breathwork and trauma. And then hopefully I think it would be a pretty solid framework to then um, use in conjunction with psychedelics down the line, whether that's in a clinical setting or even just, um, you know, end up doing retreats or in a training, I think, um, it could have a pretty useful application. Um, and then, so breaking that down, I was thinking about it, like, you know, there, there's breath work models kind of fall into the spiritual with the yoga traditions. Um, and then you have some clinical applications. I think it's starting to become like more, like more involved because, um, some of the somatic works coming out and I'm digging through Bessel van der Vander Kolk's book right now, Body Keeps the Score. And he talks a lot about breath work in Which there, is an amazing and book. yoga and Tai Chi. And so, you know, it's starting to hit there. But um, so, I mean, some of the research is like, you know, typically like deep breathing to calm yourself in like a therapeutic setting. But then you have the yogic traditions that are more in the spiritual realm. And then you have like something like holotropic breath work or transpersonal breath work that's kind of outside the scope of clinical. It's like more in the sense of like personal development, spiritual development. Um, but I mean, when you think about it coming from like the trauma theory, I mean, breath is really controls a lot of a lot of our functioning, right? It's what keeps us alive. Um, and so there's different styles of breathing. You could have like the deep, slow belly breathing that can be really calming to the uh, parasympathetic nervous system. It activates it and it um, kind of soothes the, the sympathetic nervous system, which the like sympathetic nervous system is associated with like the fight or flight. So you get activated and you're kind of in like those high arousal states. Uh, parasympathetic activation um, is associated with, quote, like rest and digest. So it's associated say with calming the body down. Um, and so deep, slow breathing can um, activate the parasympathetic nervous system and help calm down the sympathetic nervous system. Um, so thinking about that, and then the faster breathing, which can be a little bit more activating, so it can bring emotions to the surface. Um, and so the way that I've been thinking about breaking this down is how can you deal with trauma? Um, you know, there's some people that ha that I've seen in breathwork sessions that, you know, maybe it could have been, they could have taken a few more steps before going into it. Um, and the idea is like, you don't want to re-traumatize people in these bigger sessions. So how can you break it down for people that are like dealing with a lot of trauma and how do you get them in their body first? <clears throat> so I broke it down to three different phases. Um, the first phase is just like, uh, grounding and emotional regulation. So that's more associated with the, the slow, deeper breathing, um, really focusing on the therapeutic alliance with the therapist. So you're just really building rapport at that first stage. Um, and 
just really helping somebody get control of their emotions. So if they do enter like high arousal states or hypo arousal states where they're kind of frozen, you know, they're, they're able to regulate a little bit more. Um, because if somebody is in that state, you can't just throw them into an activating really big breathwork session. I just think it's somewhat counterintuitive. Um, and you want to kind of look at it as a spectrum, right? It's like some people with, you know, (laughs) 37 units of trauma could, you know, quote unquote, I'm using that very loosely, could theoretically do okay in a, in a normal breathwork session. But then there's the folks who will get there and just like either shut down or have an extreme reaction and need to get out of there. Um, and it wouldn't be helpful. Like you were saying, re-traumatize. So it's like, I've seen some pretty traumatized people do okay, yeah. but I wouldn't want to say everybody should do it. Um, right. And I'm thinking think like pretty significant, like clinical severity on the trauma, you know, like, um, you know, I have people coming in. That, well, I have one person that that's coming in that like, you know, they're just constantly looking around the room. They're kind of in like this um, hyper arousal state. They're on edge. I mean, I don't know if necessarily throwing them into a three hour breathwork session would be like beneficial. It might be, but I think like since the f- the trauma is so fresh, it's it's not. It wouldn't be that great. Um, and you know, that's something that we screen for, right? Like we're screening for thing like people that have had like a serious mental health crisis or a spiritual emergence crisis within the past six months. Um, so thinking about that, like how could like this is like maybe early on in somebody's like crisis or or trauma. So working with that emotional regulation at that first piece and getting them grounded in their body. Um, yeah, but I mean, we've seen people that have had significant trauma go to breathwork sessions and do really fine. Um, and they work through a lot of it, but I think by the time they get there, they've already controlled some of their emotions, right? Like they, they've been able to somewhat, be functional versus like somebody that comes into the fact that they can get themselves there physically yeah. is it says a lot i think yeah exactly um, versus like in the clinical model where um or clinical setting where you might be dealing with people that are just got traumatized and they're kind of in a crisis mode so how could you just use some slow breathing and body awareness and breath awareness to help them with their emotional regulation um, first to get them in the body get them grounded so question, clinical question around CAP scores, CAP scores being the unit, uh, a, a particular test, right, that um, looks at the severity of someone's PTSD. Is that accurate? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it would be interesting to do like a study around like um, if somebody with like a CAP score of 50 or whatever can um, <clears throat> hang out and do well and somebody with a CAP score of 75 can't in a breathwork session. Right. You know, that would be an interesting thing to observe. I know that's probably a bunch of years out, but <laughs> for anybody out there that wants to go for it, please go for it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's not much research within... I mean, they're, they're starting to become more and more, but it's uh, an underfunded area, I think, in, in mental health and psychology. It's just like um, researching breath work. Um, so yeah, that's that first phase is just emotional regulation, getting somebody grounded, um, and just working with somebody to, to get them yeah in their body. And then the, the second, uh, phase of this would be using breath work more in a somatic processing, um, phase. Um, so the way that I've been looking at this is it's kind of linear, but then once it gets to a certain fa- like stage, like it's not linear. I mean, you could incorporate these practices however you wanted to. Um, but the linear part is just trying to get somebody regulated and grounded. And, you know, you kind of want to titrate these steps. Um, and then the idea of titration really came from a lot of Peter Levine's work of like, you know, you really want to titrate the trauma being released. You don't want to just throw somebody in there and have it all come out. So how could we work with smaller increments to slowly release it and and work with it. Um, So yeah, the second uh, stage or phase would be, well, second phase, and then it has two stages. Um, So kind of like a somatic experiencing where you're just helping somebody go in their body, breathe into these somatic sensations in their body and help maybe process it on the body level and physiological level. And then if somebody is like maybe a little stuck, you can start activating it a little more. So that would be like a second stage in that phase. Um, Let's kind of dig into the somatic thing a little bit more because this might sound a little abstract to some folks. So the way, um, the way you and I have been talking about it based on the books we've been reading 
it's like a, a your body has this secret language almost that you don't necessarily automatically get to understand. Um, it, it takes some time to get somewhat attuned to that and to understand what the body's trying to do, right? Mm-hmm. Like, how do you elaborate that? On like the thing? somatic sensations in the body? Well, somatic sensations and then, um, you know, how, how like a traumatic experience might be held somatically. Right. Well, I, ha- um, I don't have any training in somatic experiencing, so I'm guessing I'm using that phrase in just how I've been doing it. Um, we did read some books, though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we read books by these people, you know, it's... It's not like we're totally rookies right, here. Right, right. But um, go for so it. So I guess the way what that I've got? been like working with that myself with breathing is um, just being able to like lay down and create a safe space for myself, maybe play some light music and close my eyes and turn a little bit inward and just be in the here and now and really pay attention to what's going on in my body. So just slowly breathing and paying attention to any sensation I may having, maybe having. So like maybe there's some tension, like say in my abdomen and what would it feel like to breathe a little bit into that space and and be with it? What would it be like to move that space around? Um, Maybe stretch a little bit or or what would it feel like to place your hand on that tension in your body? Um, And and the way that I, I, work for myself is just to be curious about those feelings and start to try to befriend them Um, because there can be a lot of information there and the the breath itself can help you guide the experience and help you navigate through it you know if something comes comes to the surface and it seems a little triggering or or alarming for yourself how could you use the breath to just calm yourself down and be able to explore? You know, we talk about that with like difficult psychedelic experiences where something comes to the surface. How can you use your breath to navigate through that, that space and, and kind of help um, control it a little bit? Um, so, yeah, the somatic, uh, I guess, processing or experiencing is just really starting to tune inward and be a little bit more in touch with your inner experience and the inner sensations. Um, and maybe those sensations is like, you know, as you tune inward, maybe you feel a little bit of heat somewhere in your body or maybe you feel a little bit of coolness in your body Um, maybe there's tingling sensations or tightness and so what does it feel like to um, be with those sensations and be a little bit curious and explore it yeah yeah I think that's a good a good rough sketch there and this is the kind of stuff that you get to learn sometimes in breath work too it's kind of just like We'll we'll encourage you here and there. Um, hopefully, you can do it on your own. But in the beginning phase, we'll, you know, this is what your body feels like. You know, check it out, experiment. Um, it's not necessarily super programmatic, right? It's exploring. Yeah. Like it, it was interesting to hear you say linear, because funny in our world, you know, linear equals bad right. sometimes. But it's like, you know. <laughs> we should be able to calm down for a minute and go, okay, you know, maybe I should lift five pounds before I lift a hundred pounds, you know? So, um, let's, you know, it's okay for some stuff to be sequential. Um, and especially it's like, you know, point A to point B and then you're liberated at point B to a large degree. Right. And I think like, you know, maybe it's not linear, but just dealing in small increments. Right. So it's just like a kind of like a little Mm. step program where you're not just like, just jumping into the deep end, you know, it's like dipping your toes in the water and testing the water out and then kind of dipping your way in. And once you're comfortable, you know, you can really start exploring it a little bit more in depth instead of like, maybe you don't know how to swim and you just jump right in the deep end and you're just flopping around or, you know, so it's like, you know, just taking those precautions and learning how to develop a relationship with your body. So then you can start to process some of these deeper inner experiences and emotions. Um, And then so, yeah, so I broke down that second phase into two stages, kind of like more along the lines of slow breathing, exploration, curiosity with the body sensations being with it in the here and now. And then the other uh, stage is more activation. So somebody just feels really blocked and they don't, they can't get in touch with some of that stuff. Um, maybe it would be beneficial for somebody to start uh, breathing more fully and more open. So I actually did this yesterday um, with a client and afterwards they said wow I never really realized like I've just been like really holding my breath a lot like I feel like 
I was able to breathe a lot more. Like I feel more open now because before they were just talking really quietly. They and I asked, I was like, do you feel really stuck in your body? Like is energy stagnant there? And they were like, yeah. I was like, well, let's try some of this deep breathing to see if we can activate that a little bit more. And throughout the rest of the session, they were much more open, more animated um, in their in their voice and the way they were describing things. Um, <clears throat> so how could you? How could you uh, like use a modified version of transpersonal breath work where you're using music and some um, deeper breathing? And obviously, when you're working um, in a therapy session, you only have like you know, depending on how you operate, anywhere between <laughs> like 45 minutes to an hour. Um, and so, obviously, you're not going to do a full hour of breathing um, unless you're scheduling longer sessions. So, I think I did 10 minutes of deep breathing with this this client, and that was enough to just open them up, open them up a little bit more to process some things. Um, you know, I think ideally maybe like 30 minutes would be nice if they knew what they were coming in for. Do 30 minutes of breathing and then 30 minutes of processing. Um, and then, and then so the third stage or phase um, would be outside somewhat of the clinical scope, then stepping somebody into a, a, a full group, three hour breathwork session and the things that, you know, the, the, the type of breathwork that we like to facilitate more in that realm of uh, self-exploration. And then maybe also in that realm, you're dealing with a lot of spiritual issues or collective issues. So um, the things that can come up in that uh, could be like kind of collective traumas, right? So the first two stages, maybe you're dealing with a little bit more of like the biographical personal traumas. And then um, in these bigger self-exploration um, workshops, you might be dealing with transpersonal stuff and all sorts of um, themes that you could be working with. Yeah, it's um, it's really interesting, right? Because it's almost like you're saying, okay, now you can swim, go swim and get stronger. Yeah, maybe. Um, <clears throat> what's your opinion on regularity, like in this kind of process? Say, like you got them through the clinical portion of it, like out of your office, and said, hey, why don't you go try breath work? I'm still gonna see you weekly or every other week but maybe every like two months go do some holotropic breath work. I mean, I think that would and... be kind of ideal, right? Like still use right. the different um, smaller breathing techniques within that clinical space and do traditional therapy and, or somatic therapy, but then hopefully refer them out to these larger groups, which then they're developing connections and group process as well and so i think that's a huge right. part of healing from trauma as well as developing relationships um you know a, a lot of people in the neuroscience realm and the somatic realm talk about relationships being the healing the the mind or the brain is a social organ the reason why you know we've survived over years was able to be able to create social um, connections and talk and communicate. Um, and so, yeah. So even working in that clinical space and then getting somebody hopefully a little bit more engaged with their community. And, you know, Elizabeth and Lenny always talk about the community aspect of, of breath work and how that's, um, I don't know, for me, always going there, it's been a huge community thing. It's like, oh, these people understand. And I finally kind of get to hang around with people that, that kind of get it. Um, and that in itself is is healing. But sometimes people that have been severely traumatized, they have trust issues, they can't make connections, and it, it's really hard to, to do that. So how could we yeah, work with people more in that clinical space to develop trust and um, and then get them more involved in their community or this group process thing. Yeah. And, um, regarding, uh, the Gibsons, it's, it's, um, more than just the Gibsons themselves, right? It's they've over the decades have cultivated this kind of very interesting community of folks yeah. who, you know, um, there's a similar theme to their interests. You know, there's some people who are still Catholic. I'm sure there's some people who are still, you know, involved in other religions, but, you know, overall they have an interest in psychology and Groff and in their own personal process. And that relationship with others that gets deepened over the years is, is just the extra special valuable thing. Yeah. Um, it's kind of something we're trying to develop online and in person too, right? Like how can we be the people that help cultivate community too? Cause without that, it's really hard to heal. Yeah. 
isolation uh, is pretty rough. And I think it's an issue nowadays, right? Even though we're so connected with <laughs> yeah, the internet and, and social media and all this, you know, a lot of people say we're so disconnected actually in our, our physical lives. Have I ever talked to you about the bandwidth thing? I don't think so. Um, no. Bandwidth and communication. So you know the concept of bandwidth? Yeah. Um, like you know, 28 K modems, 56 K yeah. modems. And that, you know, we're at cable and fiber optics now and 3g, 4g, 5g cell networks. Um, you know, it's great. And video communication is great, right? Like Skype is awesome, but, um, relative to being here in person where like this is 2d right mm-hmm. on Skype and on the phone, it's kind of 2d. Mm-hmm. It's like amplitude and tone, but, um, so I guess maybe it's 3D on, on Skype, then amplitude, tone, color, <laughs> and 2D image here. But um, it, it, when you get in person, you, your your depth of field kicks in, you know, for people with two eyes, and you're you're able to see a lot more body language, mm-hmm. um, the subtleties of facial muscles, and and all that kind of stuff, and intonation, mm-hmm. um, perception of intonation might even be better. So it's like a deeper or sorry, higher bandwidth communication medium on person. Like you can imagine just texts, like texts are so bad and so often like very misinterpreted. Like it's kind of a joke in our generation to like see people freaking out. Some uh, love interest sends you a message right. and then you start like sweating because you don't know how to interpret what they said. What do they are mean? They angry they with mean you? Do this? they love you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do they mean I'm going to the park? <laughs> so, you know, all sorts of stuff like that is really stressful to us. So we have this like hyper connection of low bandwidth mm. um, as opposed to like um, using our full bandwidth that we would use if we were living in a 150 person village right. and like fully enmeshed in that like 10 generations deep, you know, that's very different <laughs> deal. Um, you know, I don't really even know my neighbor's names, <laughs> which is <laughs> a big deal. Like, <laughs> I should probably learn them. I've been thinking that for a while. You guys were I know talking some of the people's about that names. when I was out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, community, like actually bringing the human organism back up to its normal capacity and what it expects as opposed to this like isolation and quiet and, and like weird um, usage of the dopaminergic system from social media. Um, yeah, there's, there's room for improvement. I guess that's all I'm really saying. Yeah, and sure. consider bandwidth as part of the equation. That's all cribbed from Robert Anton Wilson. That's not my mm. idea. Um, probably also from, from somebody else. Like the guy, uh, oh man, who is, there's this guy that gave Tim Leary a lot of coaching at one point. Not a lot, but a little bit. Marshall McLuhan, mm. the guy that was really involved in, um, <sighs> fuck. I wish I could speak to that intelligently right now. I'm not there. Okay. But he, he talked a lot about how media works and, and communication works. Uh, media theorists, we'll call him. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I don't know anything so, okay. about him. What, <laughs> what have we missed on your capstone? Um, I mean, that's about it. So I, I broke it, it up into two parts. Uh, the first part of it is um, just an overview of somatic psychology on trauma theory and incorporating those, um, you know, the work of like... Uh, Dan Siegel, Peter Levine, um, Bessel, Vandekirk, and a, and a few others. And so just understanding how trauma affects the body and the mind um, and how, yeah, trauma just influences, you know, the, the limbic system and, and does all this wacky stuff to us. And that, you know, we, we have, there are techniques and we do have an understanding on how we can start to get control over it all over again and then the second part is yeah this breathwork framework and <clears throat> kind of putting together the, this framework on how you could use breathwork in a clinical setting and then outside of a clinical setting to ho- uh, you know hopefully help resolve trauma and, and work with trauma in a, in a new way um, yeah what I've noticed Kyle and, and I think we've talked about it a bunch um, is it's really interesting to me that therapists, um, you know, they get taught clinical, you know, practices, right. But they don't necessarily get taught much about like theory and practice of trauma, mm-hmm. which, um, I, I was very shocked. Cause I'm like, I think this is the essence of what we're trying to heal in a, in a lot of cases, but you know, why are they not taught this even in their graduate programs? Um, 
it's coming, right? Like there's all these conferences going around. A lot of these names that, that you just mentioned are doing like big conferences with folks like Gabor Mate involved and, um, you know, getting a lot of attention now. But I think if folks want to be of service to the psychedelic community, if you're doing like underground facilitation or above ground facilitation, might be very worthwhile to spend some time trying to understand trauma um, through people like Peter Levine, Mate, uh, Vanderbolk, is that right? Vander, Vander Kolk. Vander Kolk. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> but that's the book, The Body Keeps the Score, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, amazing. I think he's got a couple other books that are really great too. Yeah. And I think like but. some curriculums are slow at adapting. Um, but I think a lot of the newer re- like neuroscience is helping us understand how trauma affects the brain. So, you know, it's also just a sign of the times and the technology that we have and the research that's going on. So, um, you know, I don't know the school that I'm in, I'm actually taking a trauma resolution course right now, which is great. Um, and it's actually one of the biggest classes I've ever been in. Um, and, that's optimistic. I mean, yeah, it's wonderful. We're going through all this stuff right now, which I'm kind of a little bummed about that I couldn't take this course prior to writing this capstone. So I'll probably end up going <laughs> back after I submit it and um, kind of update what I've been learning in this course as well. So this is just like a first product. I'm sure it will end up turning into multiple different things after I'm done with it and go back and do a few more edits and whatnot. But um yeah, it, it's yeah, it's yeah. Been a, I think it's, it's amazing. Been consuming a lot of my brain power, so yeah, I've been a little bit on the back burner, but it will be done hopefully soon. Hopefully, I'm submitting it on Sunday this week, and then, um, and then, I'll be done with grad school in May, and then I don't know what the future of psychedelic stay holds for us. <laughs> <laughs> we were just out. Dun, I was dun, just dun, out dun. in Breckenridge with Joe. I think we talked about it a little bit in an intro. Um, on one of the episodes, but, um, I mean, that was great. We got a lot of great brainstorming done and, um, yeah, trying to figure out what's next for us. A little bit of snowboarding. I wish we got more snowboarding in. I, I actually have an injury, so I couldn't really do too much, but next time yeah, (laughs) for sure. Um, but yeah, like pages and pages and pages of notes and, um, spent a lot of time with Marissa here, which was awesome. Um, she's super smart and very helpful on a lot of these ideas. And, um, we even got like a little photo studio thing set up, which I think a green screen's coming soon to my future, (laughs) but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, have there been, so maybe let's go. I was going to say, have there been any like, um, interesting things on your end or, um, any things that have been popping up in the psychedelic world that's been of interest of you recently? (laughs) Um, um, yeah <laughs> um we don't have to get into it too much but there was the maps uh recently publicized this breathwork workshop um it was all online a um he's a certified graph breathwork facilitator that chose to facilitate breathwork on the internet which um even though there was criteria like safety criteria like okay yes you can you can come if you pass this stuff it's i just feel like there was some risks exposed it's not necessarily that it's quote unquote dangerous. It's that there are risks and um, it's hard to really divulge those risks to people appropriately. Like, you know, you could have a manic reaction. You could have all sorts of reactions, even like a cardiac event. No one's there to really help you out. Um, so <clears throat> that was a little funky. Uh, there's a big debate on the Psychedelics Today uh, Facebook group. So just Psychedelics Today group on Facebook. Um, We'd love to have you join us if you, if you haven't joined us yet on there. Um, so we get into it. Ville Marie Narlock, um, who works for SSDP and a few other places, talked about it a bunch. Um, she actually went through and told us what she liked and didn't like. And that's all detailed in there. So that's one thing. Um, also, we'll talk generally maybe here, but I don't know. What do you, whatever you want to do. This, this concept of like we find out about a lot of things that are dangerous in the psychedelic world or potentially mm. harmful. And, um, like our relationship to coming out about that stuff is really tricky. Like, I don't really know what to do uh, often. Um, yes, we're quote unquote journalists, but that said, um, (laughs) we're journalists with no money for legal defense in the event of a situation coming up. Um, there was one comment, you know, I'd love to get some lawyers to help us out here, but you know, one comment was like, even if it's true, it's not liable if it's true, but it's like, 
it doesn't necessarily mean that we can survive a lawsuit. Um, <laughs> even if it's a fake, you know, made up lawsuit, right? Like it's a complicated set of situations. And some people were really aggressive with me about just saying it. Like, oh, I'm so sick of this shit. It's like, well, come on, you don't understand the full story. Clearly. <laughs> if it was that easy, I would just say it. Um, but there are risks that can come my way. Um, I do feel responsibility though for safety in the community. So I do feel like this conflict of like, am I going to go bankrupt from a lawsuit? Mm -hmm. Am I going to save a life? You know, maybe yes, maybe both. Um, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that generally? It's um, an interesting time in the psychedelic world. That's for sure. Um, <clears throat> sometimes it feels like the wild west uh, now that like things mm -hmm. are starting to emerge and more and more people are getting involved. Um, and I think since there is somewhat of a lack of education around certain things, it's um, like maybe people aren't making the best decisions because, you know, I, uh, they're just reading articles and just kind of want to jump right in without getting educated first. Um, and I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's tricky to, um, to figure, to navigate this. You know, I think we're kind of all in it together in, in some sense of like, how are we navigating right. all this? And when we do hear unethical stuff arise, um, how, how are we dealing with it as a community? Um, and like, is it our responsibility to speak up and to call people out against certain practices? Sometimes it, it's like, wow, yeah, we could save some lives if that's the case. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It, it's a, it's a tricky conversation and I definitely agree with you. It's like, yeah. And we could go extinct, right? Like we could, well, we could go extinct from the internet for at least a little while. If those people with all that money from inappropriate practices goes ahead and does something right. It's, it's really ugly. And I don't necessarily have faith that, you know, we would survive mm -hmm. it. I, I wish that was true. Survive it in terms of psychedelics. Say I'm going to legal, I'm going to physically exist fine. But you know, what does that do? Like we've put a lot of time and effort in here into serving the community and we don't want to just see that go away. We would love to build on what we've done so far and, you know, not see it eroded. Um, you know, maybe that's selfish. Maybe it's not. I don't know. Um, I don't see too many other people throwing themselves on swords, but there are those folks out there. There are folks taking really serious risks. I know with a lot of the sexual assault stuff, it's, it's actually really professionally dangerous often for women to come mm -hmm. out about their stories. Um, and you know, physically also like they, <laughs> the number one leading cause of death of women I think is men. Mm. So it's like, um, yeah, like it, it's scary. It's not okay really often for women to come out, but you know, it's, it's kind of the thing we're dealing with. So we are trying to understand our future out <laughs> folks out there, um, and how we can best serve the community and continue to best serve the community and not put ourselves, um, in a bad spot. Um, we are going to hopefully be talking to some lawyers soon about some of these stories and like, you know, what's, what's safe, what's not safe. And, yeah, hopefully we can we can do it and um, keep you all posted. Um, if if you want to dig into what we're actually talking about, come again to our Psychedelics Today Facebook group. There's a lot of um, conversation there and um, debate. We I'm on there almost daily. Um, Kyle's on there pretty often too, and um, we're what, a little over 1,200 people at this point on there. So it's getting good. There's a lot of really valuable discussion. Um, and I think a lot of people are finding community and, um, and it's not just another one of these Facebook groups that gets spammed all the time. I, I delete stuff pretty often that looks like spam. Um, if you want to get on other Facebook groups, you can, you can do that there and get those notifications there. It's just not going to be ours. And, um, I try to keep it a safe space too. So if people get a little aggressive and, and don't stop, um, they're gone. So it's it's a safer spot it's, a, it's i'm trying to keep it that way mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah thanks, come join thanks us thanks for moderating um, that. yeah no worries i sweat a little bit about it and i haven't cried yet but <laughs> <laughs> some, someday i'm sure uh so what else is there anything else on that topic we wanted to dig into right i think that's probably sufficient yeah. i know that's really vague but there's a lot more details on the facebook group guys if you go there go go for it and learn yeah i think um 
as we're trying to navigate this, we'll, you know, maybe we'll be less vague over time and, and whatnot. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah. What else has been going on? Let's talk about the books. There's actually, there's been, um, some cool research that just got published, I believe out of Europe somewhere. I forget, um, about LSD in the mind, the LSD, what, what it's doing in the brain. Yeah. So, so new neural imaging, um, that just came out, which is pretty interesting. I tried to read it, but couldn't get very far. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I I I, I, sk- I skimmed through it. Um, again, um, lack of time has been uh, an issue for <laughs> me, so I skimmed through it, and I, it sounded pretty interesting. Um, it it was making me think like, what's what was the difference between this study versus like the Carhart Harris study? And um, it seems like LSD does something, um, or they found like other mechanisms outside the default mode network, which is pretty fascinating. They called it like molecular mechanism, I think, which is really interesting. I, I'm like, okay, the molecular mechanism behind LSD action. Um, and it was interesting that it wasn't talking directly about uh, default mode network stuff, um, which the Carhartt-Harris work ex- pretty much exclusively had talked about. Um, curious stuff. I, do you have the title of the paper? Um... Not off the top of my head, but I could probably find <laughs> it and pull it up. Probably should have done that before we started recording. <laughs> um, <laughs> scientists think they finally figured out how LSD alters our brains. This is from uh, ScienceAlert.com. Um, it interrupts a major circuit between four parts of the brain, including the thalamus, which acts as an information filter. Essentially, the drug allowed more information to flow through the thalamus to other parts of the brain. Now that we have a better understanding of how LSD affects the brain, researchers believe they can use that information to study disorders that produce the same effect as a drug such as depression and schizophrenia. Quote, we are getting nearer to understanding the complexity of what happens with LSD in the brain. Researcher Katrine Preller told The Guardian, and that is particularly important if we are to develop new medicines. So K-A-T-R-I-N-P-R-E-L-L-E-R. And again, that's from sciencealert.com. Scientists think they've finally figured out how LSD alters our consciousness. Yeah, And, the, uh, and that's actually a pretty good, like I like that, extra information throw, flow through the thalamus. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, and then if you want to dig up the original article, it's on uh, pnas.org. And the um, the title is Effective Connectivity Changes in LSD-Induced Altered States of Consciousness in Humans. Um, and it was just published January 28th, 2019. Great. Yeah. Um what else is going on? Let's talk about our books, Kyle. Like we've got a book um, that I think we're going to be selling on Amazon really soon. Two books, actually. Yeah. Um, the Trip Journal and Integration Guide, um, both of which um, are still have been and still are available on our uh, on our shop in a digital version. But Kyle, you just opened your proof, and you're pretty impressed. Um, I did. Uh, sure we aren't doing up on video, Skype. but I can show you, Joe. Um, yeah. Oh, that looks I awesome. I just got the proof in today, so it does look pretty <laughs> great. We got a physical copy for our trip journal and a integration lot of color. book. Um, we had it redesigned from our old design. Um, looks a little bit cleaner. Uh, and so the trip journal is just a way to track your trips. There's some coloring things. There's a little bit of harm reduction information in here. Um and yeah, there's just a lot of different journaling activities, ways to um, to track your track your experience. Um, so setting intentions, like understanding what your beliefs are behind these experiences, what's your relationship to uh, your the different substances, any philosophical or spiritual beliefs about it. Um, and then there's three sections in here where, uh, yeah, you can track your trip. We have a little checklist of different things that um, to remind you what how to prepare. So, like, you know, I think we break it down into – I'm flipping the pages right now. So we have some of the essentials, such as, you know, making sure you have water, comfortable clothing, healthy snacks, important phone numbers of people you might need to call, um, a test kit – 
pure intentions, um, turning off your cell phone or putting it on <laughs> silent. And then we have uh, a nice right. little checklist for recreational uh, settings, self-discovery uh, setting, and shamanic setting. And some of these things on the items overlap, and obviously you can kind of, you know, these are just ideas. These aren't things that you need to have in these settings, but just ideas and reminders um, for some people. Um, recreational setting, you know, don't forget your festival toys or light sticks <laughs> um, <laughs> for the shamanic setting. Maybe right. you need some uh, Palo Santo sage or f- a feather for smudging, um, some rocks, tobacco, you know. And then we have a, a place where you can draw. You do a little mandala after your experience and, and just track it down. Um, I'm really excited for this physical copy. Um, it's really cool to actually have this in my hands right now. Um, so, yeah, we'll probably get that up on Amazon within the next few weeks. We just need to um, do some final edits and, and whatnot, and it will be up there for you to purchase. So there's the uh, trip journal, and then we have an integration journal. And the integration journal is just a combination of journal entries and um, just questions and activities. So like tracking your dreams uh, and just a lot of different things. It, it kind of can have a linear Helpful approach where it might quotes. be like, a, a f- I forget how many weeks I put in there, five or seven week uh, activities. So like... Um, and it kind of has this theme of planting seeds and nourishing the seeds. So, you know, you can have this flower bloom, which is the seed being your experience and how, how do you plant that and really tender to it and, um, hopefully see something manifest, uh, with your, after your experience. And so, yeah. So stay tuned uh, for the physical products. <laughs> and we'll have um, you know the ebook as well if you want to download the digital copy. Yep, that's available in shop for about ten dollars uh, in digital. And uh, I bet we'll have a Kindle version and uh, more soon as well. Um, let's talk about Arizona. Uh, we've got maybe five, ten yeah. minutes. <laughs> but let's let's chat a little bit about that. There's Arizona Psychedelic Science, is that what it's called? Arizona psychedelics conference. psychedelic conference let's just call it that <laughs> in tempe arizona which is pretty much um metro phoenix it's right next to phoenix airport um it's where the university is asu and um the conference is at the naturopathy school in in tempe um ray and amanda are putting it on uh, you'll probably hear more and more about them it sounds like they're going to be really active um in the space going forward she uh they, I think, learned about us through our activity trying to activate Phoenix uh, by, by putting on, you know, group uh, meetups. And I got to do that wor- breathwork workshop at ASU, or Arizona State in Tempe, um, a few months back, and people liked it. So, you know, got to meet Ray, and I said, hey, let's do a breathwork workshop at the conference. So we're actually doing two yeah. <laughs> breathwork workshops. It's sold out, so sorry for giving you FOMO, but <laughs> 34 people, I think, signed up for our breathwork workshops. And um, there's going to be some interesting presenters too. Um, what What's standing out for you right now about it? I'm just really excited to meet all sorts of new folks. It seems like a very different conference. Yeah, I'm just in the same boat. I'm excited for the breathwork uh, workshop and just to be able to meet people, connect. You know, I think sometimes I go to these conferences and then just end up... Uh, <clears throat> you know, just, I I really like connecting with people. So, um, I think that's the thing I'm most excited for. I know we will be kind of at a table tabling. So, um, hopefully we can switch on and off if there's a cool, uh, talk that we want to get into, um, to check that out. I'm leaving, I think Sunday morning. So I'm not going to be there for the whole, whole conference weekend, but I'll be there for Friday and Saturday. Um, right. And I'll be there all day Sunday. Um, so, Come say hi. Love to chat. Um, there's a lot to talk about. <laughs> we should probably bring some cough drops and stuff because our <laughs> last time, I I think in Oakland, we talked so much that like our throats were just like gone by the last yeah. day. Um, it was just nonstop. Actually, I think even when you were out here, we were talking so much. <laughs> it was like, oh my God, so dry. <laughs> How am I, I going to talk tomorrow? <laughs> and um, it's already dry up in Breckenridge. So. <laughs> Yeah, right. Uh, drier and tempy yeah. even. So it's going to be exciting. 
if we get some free, well, I don't think we're going to have any free time, but there's so there's like a number of really cool things in the city we should mm-hmm. check out. I, I think we should just do some like of our own breathwork workshops in Phoenix uh, in the future too. Um, I've got all sorts of friends that just want me to do it like every few months down there. So might as well. Yeah. <laughs> just got to figure all that detail. We also out. have another cool conference that's coming up um, in March that we're oh. going to. It's a yes. philosophy conference. I forget what the title is, but um, it's about ex- uh, exceptional human experiences. The I question. Think is the correct term nowadays. Exceptional experience. Yeah. So the question the conference is designed to answer is, um, <laughs> or at least ask, is uh, can excep- exceptional experiences save um, humans? Uh, you know, the implications from ecological crisis. Um, so we've got a number of people, Peter Schwartz, dead age, Dennis McKenna, uh, Lenny and Elizabeth Gibson, Daniel um, Queen, Becca Siegel, Rebecca Tarnas, Matt Siegel, um who else uh, johanna yeah. hill um and then daniel mcqueen and uh i think carla might be coming right carla clements from the mba yeah, um, yeah. trials and then um a bunch of philosophy Travis cox from naropa so uh, john cobb and john buchanan john buchanan was lenny's advisor i believe or is that john cobb um I get him. John, john cobb, cobb john right? cobb john cobb's the uh <laughs> quote-unquote dean of american theology which is really interesting. He's kind of like the top guy on Whitehead uh, in the world. He's also 90 something years old. So, um, but one of the sharpest minds I've ever seen, I saw him at a conference a couple of years back and he, he was doing incredibly well given his age. Yeah. Um, and, um, John Buchanan's friends with Lenny and Elizabeth. I think he's, uh, really, really, I think he actually certified with, uh, Groff and mm. breathwork and, um, I think he works in Hollywood or something. I don't really know too much about him, but really nice guy. Got to meet yeah. him. Unfortunately, at Groff the same college, Claremont. Um, he was on the invite list. Right. Um, but it should be cool. Like Joe and I are going to be going out there, documenting everything, um, taking notes. And some of the uh, proceedings, I believe, is going to be part of somewhat of the foundation of Dream Shadow um, and, and the breathwork training and whatnot. So, um yeah, and I think that's like what makes uh, Dream Shadow stand a little bit apart is the philosophy aspect um, rooted in Whiteheadian philosophy and process thought. Mm-hmm. Is that the correct terminology? Process thought or process philosophy? Both. <laughs> Both are good. Um, so it's it's tricky, right? It's like you look at you look at certain religious texts and stuff and it, it makes it look like you get somewhere and that's it. Like you're finished. It's like, mm, it's more like life is a whole process. Death is a process. Death is inextricably linked to the process of life and everything else. You know, there's, there's so much to process thought. Um, I think permaculture aligns really well to it because you're thinking in arcs of years, like a chair is not a chair. A chair is like the trees that make, went into it, the land that's now barren because of that the slow decay of the chair back into earth over the course of a hundred years. It's, you know, it, it, yeah, it's the process of becoming and decaying from being that thing. Um, it's really a, an interesting philosophy and it, you know, uh, to <laughs> McKenna, I, this is my line that I always say, uh, McKenna said he was the most, uh, Alfred North Whitehead who founded this branch of philosophy is the most psychedelic of the philosophers. And, Lenny goes, yeah, but Ter- Terry, he calls him, <laughs> never really understood it. <laughs> so it's like, he, he, I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. It's, you know, very interesting to hear people who are really deep in their field critique McKenna because McKenna is so convincing right. <laughs> that you're just like, sure, got it. You talk to some mathematicians, sure thing, your time wave is right. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's just interesting. Um, but it's really fascinating that his brother's going to be there. Dennis yeah. is going to be there involved in this, you know, deep philosophy and practical conference of practical philosophy. And, um, so it's a private conference. We should say that nobody can really come. There might be a public moment on the Sunday. Um, we should probably see if there's a website for this thing. <laughs> uh, and it's at Pomona college, um, Pomona or Claremont in, uh, in Claremont. I guess the town is called yeah. Claremont, <laughs> California. Um, 
Claremont, California. It's uh, two towns west of Rancho Cucamonga. You might know that from the TV comedy Workaholics. Uh, it looks like there's some stuff here online. So if you search, um, can exceptional experience help save the world? Um, you'll, you'll find some stuff about this conference. Um, and we'll keep you all posted. That's happening mid March, yeah, I think mid-March. early March. Yeah. <laughs> Kyle and I have so much going on. It's hard to even <laughs> keep track of our schedules. Um, so that's going to be a really fascinating thing and a really, um, interesting growth opportunity for us. Cause we can kind of do gonzo journalism meets interactive philosophy mm-hmm. and, record stuff that you would never ever hear um at a psychedelic conference yeah it should be interesting this is more philosophical and we're not going to talk about the architecture of the universe uh as revealed to you by the toad gods (laughs) but more (laughs) given our current state of knowledge and science what can we do with philosophy um and a cohesive philosophy that's not just going to leave us uh at the end of emptiness like a lot of you know a lot of philosophy tries really hard, but it ends up being really, you know, um, nihilistic and um, solipsistic mm-hmm. almost. So this is this is not that. <laughs> like you hear us say lines often, like I am, I am the totality of all of my relationships. I am not just like me and my human being. Like if my if someone in my village is sick, like part of We're me is sick. sick. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, it's, <laughs> if we're gonna take this. Uh, if we're going to survive on earth, we're going to be a little more global and you know, people are sick out there. How do we, how do we heal Mm -hmm. and how do we heal ourselves? And you know, we're, we're all part of this spaceship. We're inextricably linked to the Mm -hmm. spaceship that we're traveling through space at high velocity on. And it's uh, there's limited resources on this thing. So how do we all get what we need and, and stay happy and healthy? And you know, that's kind of, to me, like a lot of these questions that we're answering in psychedelics. Yeah. And can these Um, exceptional experiences help us get more in touch with that and hopefully have some sort of, um, consciousness shift to help us. Yeah. I guess get more in touch with spaceship earth. Right. Right. It's not how to make Microsoft more money. It's how do we understand who we are, where we come from better and where we're going and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, the big questions. So let's wrap here. Um, <laughs> so I hope, um, you all enjoyed that. I, I hope there was some value there for you, uh, more coming soon on all of the stuff we talked about, uh, especially those books. Um, if you want to support us, please leave us, you know, $2 a month on Patreon or more. There's a lot of great rewards on there, like discounts to cl- our current and future classes and, and a lot more. Um, we've got t-shirts and, and sweatshirts for sale. They're amazing. Like American apparel kind of quality and um i think we're going to try to get some new designs going really soon so stay tuned keep watching um and leave us a review or just reach out to us let us know you like what we're doing we need encouragement to keep going (laughs) so if you love the show you could just email us too uh, and we would love to hear from you psychedelics today email at gmail.com anything else kyle no thanks for listening and um yeah we'll see you on the other side yeah, see you on the next week. Jim Moore, Kyle Bullard, signing off for Psychedelic Today. Bye-bye.